Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Coffee with Tim. This morning, I want to talk to you about something that you may have never heard before, and then I want to ask you about some pies, see what you know about pie. So grab yourself something to drink, sit back, and enjoy this. You want to know who God is, but not sure where to begin. You want to learn about Jesus, have some coffee with Tim. This morning, I'm sitting out here in the campground, site number two exactly, at America's Keswick in Whiting, New Jersey. And it's just uh, getting towards sunset. The sun might actually come in my eyes and block my vision. But it's beautiful here tonight. It's a great place to be. Thank you for taking a few minutes of your life to spend so, with me. The new segment, uh, Mission Update, our sower... My wife and I are sowers with the Sower RV Ministry. We are here in Whiting, New Jersey to serve for three weeks. And I have two other sower couples with us, John and Chris Atkinson and Bob and Sharon Wanner. I hope I said that right, Bob. And they've been here. I'm, we're the group leaders, my wife and I, because we've been here the longest. And so we were here first. So we're like to, they were the boss. Actually, no, we just get to be the, inter, the interface between the, the people here at the camp and uh, our workers as far as our work assignments go. The man we have been working in is a uh, staff residence. It's a, it's a mobile home here on the property. It's 12 by 70 and it's had some water damage in the ceiling and they were looking for mold so they tore out the whole ceiling. And while they had that out, they decided to upgrade some, some lighting. So my crew and I, we have reinstalled the insulation twice and put sheetrock up, including we had to do some bracing and stuff for nailers, and we have installed new sheetrock for ceiling, and we've been actually texturing, uh, mudding up the patch, uh, what do they call that? We're doing that thing with the mud, making it nice and smooth and pretty, and uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll begin the, the process of painting their new ceiling and installing new trim uh, around the edges of the walls. And actually, the house looks really darn good. We've been doing a good job. My motto as a sower is, it's better than when I got here. And it certainly is better than when we got here. That's our update for sowers. You can join us on our project, and we would love to spend time. Okay, the question I have is about pies. And you might know something about pies that I don't. What? What is... A $5 pie in Aruba and maybe a $3 apple pie in Jamaica. What What is that all about? Well, actually, that would be the pie rates of the Caribbean. Those are the pie rates of the Caribbean. <laughs> okay. I, I, I love my well. jokes. Thank you, Chloe. She gave me the dad joke, bad dad joke book. So this morning, I want to touch you. Uh, I was going to take you... Uh, I tell you about the Romans Road. I don't know if you've ever heard about the Romans Road. So if you read in the Bible and you come to the book of Romans, which was written by Paul the Apostle in, uh, in the uh, late 50s of uh, the first century, and he's writing to the Christians in Rome, and, he, and he, it's the whole best doctrinal book he's ever wrote. It's got covers all the essentials, a full counsel of God, the gospel of God. And in this book, if you follow it through, they have come to what they call the Romans Road. This is the what Frank told me when I came to Jesus. He told me this Romans Road. And so we'll pick a few verses that are, that are just stand out as stepping stones as he goes through this progression of teaching. The first one would be Romans 3.23, which says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So what is, what is sin? What is that? Well, sin is actually means to miss the mark and it's commonly an archery term if you didn't hit the bullseye you missed the mark the mark is the bullseye and I actually learned, learned about carpentry up in Idaho we were doing carpentry and we're going to cut some wood to a, specifi a specified length we measure the opening exactly how long the wood would be that we needed and we'll measure that on and make a mark a pencil mark on the two by four and then we'll cut it with a circular saw and we found that, that no matter how accurate we tried to be, 90% of the time we were just a little bit off. We weren't quite straight. 
we weren't exactly on the line. And so the piece of wood was not perfectly cut, probably over 90%. Even a, a great carpenter with the best tools, is they're not ever going to get it right 100% of the time. So the fact is we missed the mark. But how important is it to, to hit that mark? Well, it depends on what you're building, first off. If you're just doing some, uh, if you're doing a tree house, it probably isn't that important if you're perfect or not. But if you're building a rocket ship, a spaceship, not out of wood, but out of something else, or an aircraft carrier plane, it's probably the tolerances are much, much closer to how perfect you have to be. Uh, so in our case, we're being judged by God. And, and we have missed the mark. And how important is that? How God is not tolerant of any sin. If you're not perfect, you don't measure up. And we aren't perfect. And that's the whole point of the law. The law was to show us the perfect standard of God. And, and, and that we don't measure up. So people will try to justify themselves. Well, I've, you know, I've lived a good life. Well, have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever lied? Have you ever uh, killed anyone? And so people, uh, the Jews would make up, the, yeah, I've never killed anyone. When Jesus came, now you're missing the point of the law. The law isn't to justify you. The law is to condemn you. And I will tell you, that it is Jesus' words, that if you've ever hated your brother in your heart, you're guilty of murder. It's just the same. The point of the law was given to expose the fact that we are sinners. Not just that we have missed the mark, that we're mostly good somehow, but we're just not perfect. Which isn't the case. We're not mostly good and we're just not and we're not just perfect. It's true, but it's it's worse than that. We have a disease called sin. And we sin, we miss the mark, we don't follow through, we're not perfect because we are flawed internally. We have a disease called sin. And so when people go out and they sin, uh, God doesn't bring judgment immediately. You know, you would think that God, if he's holy, might just bang, you're, you're in trouble right now. And uh, that, he doesn't do that. He lets you sin. If you decide to follow a sinful lifestyle, it probably will let you do that. But the point of that is so that maybe that by becoming exceedingly sinful, if you get into sin so much that you will no longer be able to try to justify yourself. You'll have to go, yeah, it's clear I'm a sinner. Look at my life. I have done nothing but sin. And so it's it's the guy that thinks he's righteous because he's not been that evil has a harder time with recognizing that he's a sinner. But whether you miss the line by a quarter of an inch or a mile, it doesn't matter. The standard is perfection. And we aren't perfect. And God expects Perfect. Be ye perfect, for I am perfect, says the Lord. So we, we have this problem called sin. It's not just that what we've done is wrong. It's what we are inside of us, this desire to do evil, to run our own life and to separate ourselves from God. That is sin. And it's from birth. You see it in a two-year-old. They don't even know any better, but they, they know that I'm, no, I'm not going to do what you said. Uh, that's my toy. I'm going to take it. I'm going to throw a fit if I don't get what I want. That's the, the sin nature starting to bubble already. It's not until you're old enough to know right from wrong when you're consciously deciding, I'm going to do what I know is wrong because I want to. That's when guilt comes. That's when you're going to be held accountable. And that usually happens in your right in your preteen area. You start to have enough knowledge, I am doing what is wrong on purpose, to be held accountable for. And you know that. You, you and I have both done what we wanted to do, whether it was right or wrong, in spite of whether it was right or wrong, because it's what we wanted to do. We have chosen to sin. We have this sin nature by birth, but we have chosen to do it. We have all done. For all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God is the standard, and we fall short. You might argue that's not a fair standard, but I'll tell you it is. Because there was a man who kept that standard, and that was his own son, Jesus Christ. God became a man. No human father had a human mother. God became a man and kept his own standard. He displayed the glory of God. John says, 
For we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. And so you have a man who kept the standard of God. He was the glory of God. It could be done. Not by us. We're ruined by sin. That's why God had to do it for us, because he had no predisposed sin nature, and he was able to be obedient. I can't even say that. Maybe he did have a sin nature from from, uh, from Eve. I'm not even sure about that. Bottom line is he never did what was wrong. He didn't choose to do wrong ever. He always did what was right. So that's the first step, recognizing that you're a sinner. Frank says to me, Tim, how many banks do you have to rob before you're a bank robber? Well, just one. Okay, so how many sins do you have to commit before you're a sinner? Well, that's actually not true. How, if you're a sinner, you're going to commit sins. Just how many will you is the question. First number two that we're going to talk about, Romans 6, 23. For the wages, well, I'm going to say Romans 5, 8. But God commends his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this is probably the key point of the whole gospel. That Jesus Christ, the perfect man, the glory of God, God incarnate, loved us. God loved us so much that Jesus Christ died for us. What does that mean? That means that the death, the punishment that I am due, that I, I owe God. God in his holiness is going to judge me. And the judgment I deserved is death. Not just death, but condemnation forever in hell. And Jesus came perfect and died in my place. He died for my sins, the sins that I committed. He died for. He didn't have any of his own. He died for mine, and he died for yours, too. And so that is the substitutionary death. He died for while we were still sinners. I hadn't even cared about God, and he'd already died for me while we were still sinners. Before we even tried to do right or wrong, he died for me. That's God's love. God sent his son to take my punishment. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is what you earn, what you are deserved. I deserve punishment, death. Not just death, but hell. I deserve that. The wages of sin is death. What you get, what you earn from sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So God offers a gift. He has purchased something. He has done something at great personal cost. It cost the life of his son to offer you eternal life. That's forgiveness. That's not death. That's the opposite of death. That's the opposite of hell. That's heaven. God has offered to forgive us and give us everlasting life. It's a gift. You can't earn this gift. God did it for us. We can't overcome our own sin. We don't have the cure for sin. God has made a cure for sin. And that's, he's going to take the sin out of us and give us a new spirit. And that is the trade. Jesus didn't just stay dead. He rose again. God, after God had emptied his wrath on his son, there's, Jesus is an infinite being. The Father has a finite amount of wrath. There's a finite number of people. He put all the sin of the world on Jesus. And Jesus paid for all of it. But he was still God afterwards. He wasn't exhausted. Finite amount of sin, infinite God suffering. That's over. It's paid for. Jesus can come back from the dead. That's the glory of God too. So the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And to receive a gift... You just simply must accept it and take it and make it your own. You have to believe it's yours. And so this is the gospel. that You are, you are condemned in your sin. You deserve it because you chose it. God is right to punish you for your sin. But God loves you so much that he paid for your sin for you. And if you're willing to turn back to God and receive his son, Jesus Christ, that debt will be canceled you will no longer owe it, and you will be given eternal life. That's called justification. And justification doesn't mean just as if I had never sinned. It's even better than that. It means just as if I had always done the right thing. 
when it came time to make a decision whether I was going to do the wrong thing or not, I get credit as if I had done the right thing every single time because Jesus did it right every single time. And that is the trade. And it's humbling because you have nothing to contribute. You didn't do anything. You didn't do anything but sin. And God is willing to take your sin off of you and put it on Jesus and give you eternal life. And it closes up uh, in chapter 10 of Romans. Paul writes that if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made, resulting in salvation. For whosoever, whosoever, that's you, that's me, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't matter how far you fell short in missing the mark. It doesn't matter the number of sins, the quality of your sins. Doesn't matter. You could have missed the mark by a micron. You could have been the best. You could have been Mother Teresa or whoever and missed it. You still missed it. Doesn't matter. You're condemned to hell because you can't get justified on your own behavior. You can only get justified by a perfect substitute that takes away your sin. And that is Jesus Christ. And that is the Romans road to salvation. And when Frank told me that road, I came to the end of that realizing for the first time in my life that I was condemned righteously, but Jesus had died for my sins. And I needed a savior and I believed it. Jesus can forgive my sins. He's the only way out of my predicament. I have condemned. I've already sinned too much. It doesn't matter. One sin would have been too many. I'm condemned before God. God is willing to forgive me. God is willing to take me back. But I knew in my heart, if I turn back to, to, to God and accept this, I'll, I'll lose my sin. I will no longer have the right to sin. I gotta give up my sin. When I come, it's going to be different. If I take Jesus, I will have to live differently. And I didn't want to live differently. I thought my sin was the bomb. I hadn't had enough of that sin. But then Frank said to me, what happens if you die tomorrow? And you die in a car accident and it's too late. Then what? And immediately I was reminded of all the time. So God had had mercy on me. I'm sinning crazy doing stupid things. And God could have easily allowed me to be killed and taken me to judgment. And I would have had no excuse. But now that I knew the truth, now that I knew that I could have been forgiven, if I died tomorrow, what am I going to say to God? I didn't want your salvation. I didn't want to be forgiven. I wanted to go to hell. I took a chance that maybe I could get away with sin for a longer period of time and that somehow later I would come to Jesus. And the point is, if you're not willing to come to Jesus now, you may never get another chance. Why would you put off forgiveness? You lose your right to sin, you gain eternal life. And, and the side benefits of this eternal life are crazy cool. Joy like I've never experienced. Love, acceptance, a clear conscience. Love from a whole family of God. And yeah, it's, it's, some of it's difficult, but the goal, the outcome is so much better. If I hear a siren now, I know it's not because I did something wrong. I have a clear conscience. When hard times come, I have hope for the future. And I'm not afraid of death because I know that I am going to be accepted in the Father's home. Jesus said he went to take a place for me and I have a purpose to my life. And it's a good, I was made for this purpose. You are made for this purpose. Take the gospel, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Turn your heart to follow him and he will make your past straight. Start putting his word in your heart. Start going to church with Bible believing uh, church where they can teach you the scripture. Start reading the Bible. Start following Jesus. And as you do that, the full benefit of that salvation that he has offered will be yours. Please do that. Well, Father, I thank you for your grace to me. I thank you, Father God, for the clearness of your word. Thank you, Jesus, that you took my place. Thank you, Jesus, that my salvation has absolutely nothing to do with how close I can come to the mark. 
fact that Mark has already been met. I have full credit as if I cut my wood exactly right. Because it's not my wood. It's the wood you gave me. You gave me Jesus. He is going to fill the gap for me. And I'm free from that. And I'm forgiven. And I'm washed. And I'm a new creation. You gave me a new heart. There's so many things you do at the time of our salvation. I thank you for those. And I pray for my listeners today. Those that don't know you today. Knock on their heart that they might respond. And those, Father, that know you might be emboldened to speak the gospel clearly and accurately in love to their friends and neighbors and their families. Lord, we want your salvation. We want you to come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come soon, Lord Jesus. You are my hope. You are my hope. I can't wait to meet you, Jesus, face to face. For when I see you, I will be like you, and I will know as I am known. This is your promise. Thank you for that hope. All right, coffee heads. Cast six, homies, church people, uh, whoever else, new new peoples. Thanks for watching. Uh, obey the gospel. We're called to obey the gospel. That's turn from your sin and receive Jesus Christ. Come follow him. Join me. And if you've done that, holler out. I want to rejoice with you. And uh, unless the Lord comes, and he, by the way, he's coming soon. He's coming soon. Except the Lord come this week. I'll see you next week. Lord willing. And that, that, that is all, folks.